So Jonathan Barnett's study, uh, which I thought was very well done and, and quite extensive, is all documented by FEMA in Appendix C in their, in their BPAT report that was May of 2002. Unfortunately, it was never used in the NIST report and, uh, and it was, wasn't really used in the explanation uh, for how the buildings fell in the FEMA report either. So it seems that although the report was done and it was very well done, it was never really used by the report to explain or, 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 or should I say that the questions that they brought up in that, in that report, which are, how do you get that much, where did the sulfur come from? How much sulfur do you need to create these phases? And how do you get the temperatures required to create the phases? I, I believe in the report, uh, they put a minimum temperature of 940 degrees C to create the phases, and that's at the eutectic. So those questions were never addressed by either the report um, or uh, uh, either, either by Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Barnett's report or by the FEMA report itself or by the NIST report. These, these questions were never addressed. And I think they're significant because you have to, I mean, you've got this evidence here. How do you, how do you get those temperatures? How do you get, where do you get the sulfur? These are things that, that we should be asking and people should be investigating. So around in 2006, uh, Steve Jones was uh, working on some other evidence that he had acquired, which was uh, dust evidence. And one of the things that he was doing was going through that dust and with a magnet and finding uh, spheres, microspheres, whatever you want to call them, um, and and looking at those spheres and trying to get the composition of those spheres. It's a it's it's a a, a difficult task at best to try and determine the composition of these spheres because uh, in order to get the internal composition you've got to somehow break these open and, and fortunately we were, uh, he was able to find some that were actually broken open. Uh, at this time Steve was working with a student uh, at Brigham Young University, uh, a BYU student, a physics student and uh, Daniel Farnsworth is his name and he um, and together they were working on the electron microscope and uh, using x-ray analysis to try and determine the chemistry of these microspheres. Uh, when, uh, to be honest, when Steve told me um, he was looking through the dust, through these dust samples, I, th I thought this was a, a fool's errand. I just thought, you know, this is a needle in a haystack. I didn't, I didn't really think that they'd find anything significant, uh, to be honest. I really didn't. And I was stuck, you know, I mean, I, 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 so I stuck with working on these uh, steel uh, samples, which I thought were significant, and I, I still do. Um, eventually, Steve came to me and said, we're finding uh, these red-gray chips. And I really didn't think anything of it. Um, it could have been, they, they could have been anything. And, um, but he kept, the, the, the significant thing about the red-gray chips was not just the frequency in which they were finding them, but also they were attracted by a magnet, and which, is, which was his method for uh, pulling out these spheres. And so he was pulling out the spheres as well as the red-gray chips. And so he came to me and said, we're getting some, some interesting compositional analysis from the red layer of these red-gray chips. We're actually seeing peaks of aluminum as well as other, other things, but the, the aluminum peak was significant because uh, you, and, and so he'd find these aluminum peaks and as well as iron peaks and oxygen peaks and, and, and various other peaks, but the aluminum and the iron and the oxygen together were very significant because this is the, your composition for thermite. Um, so that's when I started to get a little bit more interested in the dust and get more interested in these red-gray chips. So, um, but I didn't really start working on these red-gray chips, and Steve and Daniel were, were continuing to find uh, things about the chips, and they would bring that information to me. And eventually I said, okay. We were, I remember we were sitting uh, in my office, and he was talking about the red-gray chips. And I thought, okay, if you really want to see if these red-gray chips are significant, um, what we could do is take one of these chips and put it in a calorimeter and see if they're energetic. And, uh, and at that point, Steve was saying, well, how do we find a calorimeter? Who's got a calorimeter? So I found a, a lab that had a calorimeter that we could use. Uh, a, it's, it's a DSC, a differential scanning calorimeter. 
and, um, and learned quickly how to use the calorimeter and how to calibrate it and make sure that we were doing everything properly. I actually had um, somebody that really uses it a lot um, there with me as I conducted these experiments. And so we, we put one of the chips, uh, one of the larger chips that we had um, into the calorimeter and let it run to see what would happen. And that was really a turning point for the red-gray chips for me because we got a peak on the calorimeter which shows that these red-gray chips were energetic. They were putting out uh, more energy and I mean they were, they were very exothermic. And the, the, the uh, width of the peak was also significant because the, it showed the power that the chips had. Um, and so that's, that was really the turning point for the red-gray chips. And that's when I got very interested in the red-gray chips and, and joined them in their study of the red-gray chips and really took off with that. So that was, uh, but th the, the significance of the, of the calorimeter cannot be uh, understated here. Uh, the calorimeter can't lie to you. If that thing uh, pops off, if you, if you get a sharp peak in the calorimeter, that material is energetic. Um, and the, the degree to it, you know, the, the degree of its, of its, uh, of its energy um, is, is determined by the height of the peak and, and the power at which it, it goes off is, is the width of the peak. But we were finding very narrow peaks and very, t very high peaks in the calorimeter, which showed that this, this very, very small chip had a lot of energy packed into it, uh, more than you would find in everyday materials at the office. So, um, and certainly the, the number of chips that they were finding in these random dust samples made the, the fact that, uh, I mean, the fact that they were present there in such quantity um, also made them significant. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't an anomaly. It certainly wasn't an anomaly because we were, we were getting multiple dust samples from, from multiple indiv individuals who uh, had no connection with each other, had no connection to Steve or myself, and they're sending us these uh, dust samples and every one of the dust samples was, was showing red-gray chips. And they were uh, it was striking in their similarity. Uh, you can you, uh, the paper that we wrote about the red gray chips. You can actually see we've taken um, images of of these uh, photographs of these red gray chips to show these things are so similar. We we couldn't ignore these red gray chips any longer, and um, and that's where the that's where the paper um, really took off. That's where the data for the paper really took off. Some have speculated that the red gray chips are are just paint. Um, I haven't seen any studies of paint by, by those that are speculating this. Um, we did our own study of paint in the DSC and found that the, the paint will eventually burn up and turn to ash, but it certainly doesn't give you an energetic spike in the DSC. So we, we actually did some experiments to compare the elemental composition of uh, primer paint from the Trade Center uh, steel. Um, that was taken off of one of the uh, beams um, in the, the, the Clarkson College beams. Um, but it was taken from one of the beams used in the, in the World Trade Center. And, um, and the, the chemical composition did not match that of the red-gray chips. So we, we know that it's not the primer paint that was on the steel. So once the, uh, once the chips were ignited in the DSC, we, we then looked at the residue uh, or the remnant of those chips in the, uh, in the microscope again. And we did find very, very small spheres um, that were similar to the microspheres that Steve was finding in the, in the dust samples. Um, uh, smaller on average, but uh, still very similar in, in uh, composition and, and in look uh, of the, the microspheres that Steve was finding.